Hey everyone, Happy New Year. I hope you had a great and restful holiday. I'm recording this introduction on January 4th, 2021. And I'm sharing this interview today that I recorded a couple of weeks ago with John Capitolupo, co-founder of Whoop, the maker of the Whoop strap system that I've been talking about for the last several episodes. And at the risk of sounding like an infomercial for this neat product, I've really enjoyed using the Whoop strap for the last few months. And if you're not familiar with it, the Whoop strap is a wearable device that tracks all sorts of cool metrics, including sleep, calorie burn, heart rate, and much, much more. As John notes in the podcast, the folks at Whoop are using data science and machine learning to optimize personal health. And they do this through these proprietary metrics that are generated from this device. And don't worry, John goes into the details on this. And regardless of whether you're in the market for some you know, wearable tech, I think you'll find this stuff quite fascinating, if for no other reason but from a product development and an engineering standpoint. It's just really fascinating stuff. We also discuss Whoop's involvement in research and detecting the early stages of both COVID-19 and Alzheimer's disease. They're funding lots of interesting research in these areas. And I think this device and the data that it produces is giving us a window in the future of big tech and big data, public health research, and so on and so forth. So it's really fascinating times that we live in for sure. If you're interested in trying out a Whoop strap for yourself, check out join.whoop.com forward slash Matt and save 30 bucks in the process. You can also go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash Whoop and that will take you to the right place as well. That's behavioralobservations.com forward slash Whoop. And at the request of a listener who's been a Whoop user for quite a while, I've created a Facebook group, Behavior Analysts Who Whoop. So feel free to join the group, ask questions about the device, and so on and so forth. Uh, You don't have to be a Whoop user to join it. And I'll have links to this and as well as all the other things we talk about in the episode in the show notes over at behavioralobservations.com. On a different note, I also want to let you know that I've decided to start a Patreon for behavioral observations. I arrived at this after much consideration Uh, A lot of thought went into this, and it's something that, you know, when I first heard about Patreon, I felt like it was a mechanism for asking for a handout, kind of like an internet tip jar, and I really didn't think it was, there was enough value for you, the listener, to make it worthwhile. And what I've come to learn is that, fortunately, Patreon has really stepped up their game to the point where they're able to offer subscribers these really cool benefits Specifically, you know, depending on which membership tier is chosen, subscribers can access an ad-free podcast fee, which means you don't have to listen to me talking like this before the interviews. Uh, that's just a brief introduction and just right, we get right to the point. Um, let's see. Uh, subscribers only bonus content, discounts in the Behavioral Observation CEU store, and much, much more. Again, my goal is to make this really, really valuable for uh, for members. So. You know, earlier today, for example, I just uploaded a great Q&A session with Greg Henley that was recorded for the Behavior, Behavioral Observations membership group last spring, uh, and that's available f- for all access and institutional level subscribers over at Patreon. I'm also working with a few other ABA companies. I hope to be able to offer subscriber-only discounts or products and services from other folks in our field. So if this sounds good to you, head on over to patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations to learn more. Again, that's patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations. Okay, I think that's it for opening comments. So without any further delay, please enjoy this fascinating interview with John Capitolupo. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. John Capitolupo, thanks for joining me today in the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing? Great. I'm excited to be here, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Oh, the pleasure's been mine. So we're going to take talk about all things WHOOP today. And uh, I've been using the Whoop strap for the last couple of months, and it is just such a cool piece of tech. Uh, and so it's 
a great, uh, great uh, a privilege to be able to chat with you and pick your brain about all the thinking that went into its development that's currently going into its, um, I guess, ongoing iterations and things like that. So I suppose the place I'd like to start, though, is for those who may be unaware, um, you know, from your point of view, I, I call it a device, um, you know, some people refer to it as wearable technology. From your point of view, what is the Whoop strap? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually view Whoop as an entire system that helps people optimize their performance. And so, yes, the Whoop strap is a part of it, the actual hardware, but the Whoop system incorporates both the hardware, uh, the data that comes off of it, and then the analytics system that helps people change their behaviors to optimize their performance. So it's all three of those things. And the Whoop strap, the hardware system itself, is a continuous uh, monitoring device that continuously measures variables about your physiology, namely your heart rate, heart rate variability, motion. There's a couple other things we measure too, like respiratory rate and temperature. Uh, and this data, I think a very unique part of the Whoop strap itself is that it's continuously sampling. So 24 seven, we never turn the sensors off. We never do like a measurement one minute, then wait five minutes and take another measurement, but truly 24 seven continuous monitoring, getting every single beat of the heart. We take all of this data, stream it over Bluetooth to mobile applications and then the cloud, where we provide a complete analytics suite back to the end user that helps them understand the, how their physiology has evolved throughout the day. So we do that by breaking into three main components. The first is a strain score, which is a single number representation of the cardiovascular stress you've placed on your body throughout the entire day. The really cool thing about this score, right, if you go for a run or a bike ride, obviously you're going to have high strain. But I think what's really fascinating is that most people don't really account for all the other things they do on their uh, do to their body throughout the course of a day and how that may impact whether they should work out, how they're going to perform, things like that. Uh, I think a good example is, you know, doing a podcast or, or giving a lecture or, or flying on a red eye flight. All of these things put a tremendous amount of strain on the body. And so you may think it's a rest day because you weren't in the gym, but how restful actually was your day? And so having this single number uh, that just kind of accumulates over time is a really helpful check-in point for people. Uh, the second component of our analytic system is all around sleep. So we give you a complete quantitative breakdown of your sleep, like you get from a sleep lab. So not only do we automatically automatically detect when you went to sleep and when you woke up, but we also break it down into the stages that you would get at, at a medical sleep lab. So slow wave sleep, REM sleep, uh, micro disturbances, things like that. Uh, and then another unique part of WHOOP is that we not only monitor sleep, but we have a sleep coach that tells you how much sleep your body needs based on your sleeping patterns, your physiological baseline, how much strain you've accumulated if you've worked out or had these stressful days uh, and things like that. And so we tell you how much sleep you need track how much sleep you got and give you a score that represents how rested you truly are physiologically rested. And I think the, the really important thing from a behavioral standpoint too, is you don't need whoop to tell you, you need about eight hours of sleep, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but a lot of people, I would say almost any of everybody, you know, thinks maybe they are getting that eight hours of sleep or, Oh no, I know, but it's fine. I can get by on seven hours of sleep. But if you actually looked at it and measured it as we do at whoop, yeah, maybe you thought you went to bed at 10, got up at six, eight hours. But actually, you went to bed at like 10, 15. It took you 15 minutes to physiologically fall asleep. You had six to 10 micro disturbances throughout the night, which is totally normal. Uh, you're not consciously aware of it, but you're not physiologically sleeping. And then you got up and you're rolling around. All these different things add up. And you were in bed for eight hours, sure. But you maybe only got six and a half hours of physiological sleep. So when you paint that picture, it really drives people like, oh, wow, maybe I should change things. How do I optimize this? How do I get a little bit more sleep than I needed, thought I needed to optimize my performance? And then the last part of our analytic system is the recovery score. I think this is the stickiest and most proprietary part of the WHOOP system. And this is a simple number, zero to hundred percent, green, yellow, red, that tells you if your body is physio physiologically ready to perform that day. Uh, so it takes in things like heart rate variability, resting heart rate, and your sleep, and gives you the simple number day after day. And we were the first wearable actually to tell people, hey, you know what, today's not a good day. Maybe take a rest day. It wasn't always go, 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 always get 10,000 steps, always get 21 strain. It was really your body is a dynamic system. Some days are good, some days are bad. Some days you really push yourself the day before and you need to take rest to, uh, to account uh, and properly optimize. I see. So I'm looking at my phone right now and my recovery is 82%. Great. So, so what 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 does that mean functionally? What what yeah. what's the take home message from that? 
Definitely. So that means that your body, 82%, you're in the green, you're ready to go. Your body is primed to perform that day. And so depending on the context in which you're training or want to perform, what type of performance, your body is going to be able to put out a higher level of output or adapt even better to a physiological or psychological stress you put on it that day if you're in a training mode. So it's kind of green as go. So you can kind of do whatever workout you wanted and maybe even push yourself a little bit harder than, than you were planning to. I see. And so I guess that would be contrasted with a situation where if I got a terrible night's sleep, either limited hours or poor quality or some combination of both, uh, I would get a different score, a lower percentage, and that would be a cue to maybe take it easy or not go for that, you know, kind of personal record or personal mm-hmm. best on whatever type of fitness measure you're 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 looking at or something along those lines. Exactly, exactly. And I think the really powerful and fascinating thing too is what other behaviors can correlate in there that causes you to have those red recovery days. So yes, sleep is obviously a big component of that, but maybe there's lifestyle choices, you know, drinking is the most obvious one that can really impact your physiological system and how ready your body is to perform the next day. But whoop allows you to track all kinds of different behaviors, maybe melatonin or CBD or ice baths, who knows how it is. And everybody's body is so individualized and how they'll respond to these various modalities that keeping track of it can help you understand better uh, to help you kind of formulate a plan to get you in the green as often as possible. You know, I, uh, uh, it is interesting. So, uh, you know, anecdotally, you know, that, you know, ha- having a couple of beers or, or whatever will mm-hmm. impact your sleep. And it's interesting. I've noticed this, uh, uh where, um, you can actually tell, you know, and, and it's every once in a while I'll get this note saying, Hey, you know, uh, every time you've, log that you've uh, you know drank alcohol your sleep is you know is is uh, markedly less uh, mm-hmm. you know in terms of quality and i, I um so yes I've, I've witnessed that firsthand so yeah so every morning i get this little prompt to to say did you did you drink last night or how much coffee did you have or mm-hmm. or things like that so that the the, the analytics uh, has been really uh uh, I was going to use the word eye opening, but again, it's like one of those things where it's like, I, you know, you, we don't need Whoop to tell us that, that, you know, sleep, there's plenty of other existing evidence that, you know, alcohol impairs sleep quality. But it's, uh, but when you get a message saying, like, uh, on, you know, X percentage of nights where you've reported, ha- you know, having alcohol, your sleep quality is diminished by Y percentage or something like that, that that's an altogether different message. So it's, it's definitely, definitely pretty cool. Yeah. That individualized piece I think is very key for almost anything with physiological data is that there's a lot of these blanket studies that have been out there, that, the longitudinal studies even uh, that show these effects. So yes, alcohol bad, but like the individualized response to it and every other variable too, it's not a controlled like physics laboratory experiment where you're only changing one variable that's impossible to do with humans. Right. And mm-hmm. so how do all these other things factor into it? And what will that mean for my body? And this kind of what whoop unlocks the ability to do. Yeah. So, uh, I want to wind the clock back a little bit and talk about how whoop started. Uh, and so let's just talk about that. So how, how did whoop start and what, w- what was the, I guess, either hole in the marketplace you were trying to fill or what problem were you trying to solve when developing this, technology or the system as you described it earlier. Yep. So we've been around for eight and a half, actually almost nine years now. And so whoop, the first ideas for it came from our CEO and founder, Will Ahmed. Uh, He was the captain of the squash team at Harvard athlete all his life. uh, And he was a super competitive person. So somebody that was constantly overtraining, not tapering before the game days, getting injured, maybe not performing as well as he wanted to, but just because he had the mindset, go, go, go. And back then, you have to remember, this is like 2010, 2011, wearable wasn't a word yet. Fitbit mm-hmm. had just come out with their first step counter. You put it in your pocket, it tracked them or steps you took. So that's all there was on the market. He picked that up, realized, you know, as an athlete, all it told him was that he was taking a lot of steps every day, uh, which wasn't very useful. So put that down and kept searching and came across chest strap heart rate monitors, uh, like companies like Polar and stuff. So those have existed for a long time, but really, especially even back then, it was more of a niche product for endurance athletes. As a squash player, he had never been exposed to it. Uh, but he picked it up, wore it somehow while he was playing squash, and for the first time, 
got objective data about what his body was doing and how hard he was pushing himself while he was working out. And he's like, well, it's you know, kind of interesting. So he started to dive a little bit into the physiology literature and realized that monitoring your body the two hours a day when you're working out, of course, is important. But what happens the other 22 hours of the day? How does your body adapt to the stresses you put on it? How does it rest? How does it recover? How did you sleep? All of these questions could dictate how you should train even more so than the monitoring the training itself. And at that time, there was literally nothing uh, on the market doing this. It was unthinkable to wear a chest strap 24 seven, just be too uncomfortable. They weren't designed for it. Um, and that was really the impetus for whoop was to build a continuous wearable monitoring system that could monitor metrics like the chest strap, but also pair it with an analytic system. I think what became apparent in even just a surface reading of the literature is that physiology is noisy, hard to interpret, needs lots of context. And so he just didn't want to provide numbers to people. He wanted to under provide insights to people. Uh, his background's in the, in the sports and business side. Uh, so you met myself. I was a sophomore at Harvard studying astrophysics and computer science. And my dad happens to be a professor of anatomy and physiology at Grand Valley State University in, in Michigan, where I'm from. And so I always had a little bit of the physiology knowledge just from growing up with my dad. Uh, I knew a few things. And so when Will came to me with the idea, I got really excited because in astrophysics, the projects we were working on, whether it was simulations or observations, you'd be dealing with huge terabytes and terabytes of data, drawing conclusions at really high statistical significance levels. If you look at the academic exercise physiology literature, especially back then, but even so today, it's like 10, maybe 20 people in the largest studies. It's hard to get athletes to come to the lab. They drop out over time. Then measurements are noisy. And at the end of the day, you can't really say very powerful statements just because the data is so noisy. And I was like, wow, well, if we built WHOOP, put it on 100, 1,000, a million people, we could easily collect the world's largest exercise physiology data set, not only to build this product, which can deliver value to these athletes, but to just advance human knowledge forward in physiology. Uh, if you haven't picked up on it yet, I, I'm a huge nerd. So that idea got me really excited. I uh, dropped out of Harvard after my sophomore year and joined up with Will. One of my good friends, Aurelian Nikolai, joined us as the third co-founder. He graduated Harvard with a degree in mechanical engineering as, as kind of like the hardware lead. And it was the three of us in the early days to build out this continuous physiological wearable system paired up with this analytic system that could help people understand their bodies and guide them to peak performance. Wow, what a cool story. I was going to ask you how you got, because I saw on your LinkedIn profile the astrophysics background. I was curious what the connection was from astrophysics to human performance. And so I appreciate you outlining that. Um, so t tell me a little bit about like, what were the first iterations of the, the, the device itself and uh, how has it changed? Uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, I don't know if you're able to give any hints or sneak peeks in terms of what things might look as it continues to evolve. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of the product? Yeah, definitely. So the first thing is hardware is really hard to build. <laughs> That's something okay. that uh, became very apparent very early on. It's like software startups, you know, you can iterate very quickly, uh, which is great. With hardware, there's just fixed times to make toolings and things like that. And it's also hard to miniaturize power, energy requirements, things like that. And so the early days, it was all focused on how can we monitor the body the best continuously that was our sole focus so the first whoop strap had maybe like 16 hours of battery life it was you know two things tethered together to a computer and all, all these different things going on but we had a laser focus that if we could monitor the body with very high precision very high accuracy and a certain amount of key variables that we would be able to power this analytic system and so it really was the first thing was getting strain and sleep and recovery trying to monitor those three things, building the algorithms around it, collecting data with, we actually use a lot of like of the Harvard sports teams when we were first starting, just because the relationships we had to test products, gather data, develop algorithms. And once we got that system, we saw, you know, pretty sticky engagement, people naturally resonated with it. And we started iterating on it to provide just a better user experience, you know, longer battery life. We have about five day battery life now, better Bluetooth connectivity and things like that. Um, and I think the biggest differentiator, uh, especially back then, but even today for Whoop, is the lack of a screen. And I think that just goes to the fundamental thesis around Whoop that we're laser focused on analyzing and understanding human physiological data. A screen, like one of the truths, I guess, with wearables actually is, you know, battery life is king. 
and batteries haven't really improved that much in the last 10 years. So you have a fixed amount of stuff you can do with your energy budget and you want to make a small device that can people can wear comfortably on their wrist. And so that's, you know, a double edged sword. You want to keep adding features and things like that, but you also want to have a large battery life, uh, battery life, but you don't want to have a large battery. And so that's why the whoop strap is the way it is. We're decided, you know, we could add a screen, an app store, all these different things, GPS, but instead there's other products that are really good at doing that. We wanted to be the best at what we did and we are laser focused to this day. And as we continue, you know, future generations of development, it's what are other things can we add to the system that will help us understand people's bodies and behaviors even better? Yeah. You know, it was interesting. I probably about 10 or 15 years ago, I stopped wearing a watch. Um, the watch I had broke mm -hmm. and it was kind of like, you know, around the time where, you know, cell phones were relatively ubiquitous. And so if I want to know what time it was, I would just, you know, look at the clock on the wall or put, pull my phone out of my pocket and look at it. So it, it's, it's nothing I ever missed. So uh, it is funny that when I put, did put the whoop strap on for the first time, I found myself looking at it as if it was a watch and that, that, that behavior extinguished over time because obviously there was nothing to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, for, from my perspective, what I, enjoy about the, the the hardware itself is that it's not it's intrusive at all you know so after after i got over trying to look at a watch face that wasn't there you know i, I oftentimes just kind of forget it's on uh yeah. and, and i thought i was going to have trouble like sleeping with it uh and and uh really haven't at all uh and again i'm really weird about that sort of like funny about the, you know it's like i even when i um wore a watch i would never sleep you know uh, i always took it off you know mm -hmm. and i would take it off like the first chance i get you know and things like that so uh so the 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 device itself is, is relatively comfortable and you kind of forget about it the only time i really futz with it at all is that uh, sometimes i might rotate it on my wrist to the inside if i'm doing something that where i think it's going to impact the sure the actual uh, business side of the of the device mm -hmm. um you know so like for example like a like a kettlebell clean or a snatch or something like that you know i don't want to bash it and that's and it, uh it seems to still function properly when it, mm -hmm. when you do that so um yeah so i just wanted to to, to comment on my experience with regard to that so yeah it's been a fun little thing to uh, experience and and again, the data as we, we as behavior analysts, we, you know, kind of pride ourselves on looking at data. And so to have this kind of continuously available stream of information to check out is, it's really neat. So um, what have you learned about the, you know, is there a typical whoop user? Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, if you look at the website, you see stories about these like super duper, ath super human athletes doing all these cool things. Like I consider myself, you know, uh, an average Joe probably in, in all aspects of my life, you know, I'm not, I'm not an endurance athlete. I'm not going to run a marathon anytime soon and things like that. Um, you know, do, do you, do you have a sense of, uh, is there a typical whoop user or does it run the gamut? Um, talk yeah, to us a little bit about, you know, that what, what you've learned from the customer base. Yeah, I think, it's been a really interesting journey for us uh, on, on this area. So this is a quite exciting topic. So uh, we started with professional athletes. We actually weren't even a consumer product when we first launched. It was only uh, professional and collegiate athletes. And then in 2016, we launched to the consumer audience with a very premium product and price point and things like that. And so early on, we were like, hey, who's you know, cares about being in peak performance probably the most and was athletes. And so that's where we started and really captured, captured that market. But over time, we've broadened that market because one, there's just been, I think, an inherent shift in, in consumer behavior that maybe we should know a little bit more about our bodies. How do we be healthier? How do we feel more well? Things like that. Uh, and so the importance of sleep in the consumer consumer mind, I think, has also been increasing over time and we provide very great sleep analytics. And so for, for whoop, what we've decided like worked really hard on is that our typical user is someone that's motivated to change. So it's not somebody's like, Oh, maybe I should lose a little like five pounds or something like that. If you're like, Hey, I need to lose five pounds and here's my plan. And I'm really motivated. How can I optimize for that? Or you're a uh, motivated athlete, whether an average Joe athlete, you know, just competing whenever you can, or someone that's PRing for weightlifting competitions and things like that. 
Also, a totally other side is the cognitive side. So we have traders and executives that are very motivated to perform at a high level. And all these people find commonality on Whoop. How can I understand my behaviors, change them, and to achieve optimal and peak performance? And so that's really the, the typical user. And I think we think of it as in three categories. There's one, I am an athlete. I, I want to perform at the highest level in athletic endeavors. The second category is... I want to either stay or get fit. And the third is I want to be healthier or more well. I want to sleep better. I want to feel better during the day, things like that. So those are the three main categories. Uh, and it doesn't all have to be, I guess, physical performance. I just painted in the light of physical performance, but I think the cognitive side is really important too. So maybe you don't, you're not a, a sports athlete, but if you're a hedge fund trader and you, you feel like a professional athlete in some sense, just in a cognitive capacity, um, and those people really find a home on Whoop too. Fascinating. Uh, do you see differences in, you know, I've noticed my own use of it, um, I've seen differences in strain outcomes based on the type of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so for example, if I go on a, uh, if I go mountain biking or, you know, I, I don't run a lot, but if I go for a run, that really cranks strain through the roof. Uh, but there are times where I will be lifting weights uh, and I'm not, um, uh, I'm doing it at a point in which that, you know, my, my heart rate's not super elevated. Uh, but I, you know, the next day I can't walk, but throughout the exercise time, I'm, I'm not winded or anything like that. Uh, and, and as a, as a result, my strain score is still relatively low. Have you noticed differences in that? You know, so in other words, I guess where I'm, where I'm getting at is that there are times where I'll do some activities, you know, I guess both types of activities have, have exertion, uh, perhaps manifested in different ways. Uh, and, uh, have you have you noticed a difference or is this something that you guys have data on in terms of looking at the outcomes for strain in particular with either weightlifters versus people who are more cardio based athletes? Definitely. Yeah. So uh, weightlifting strain is for sure going to be way lower than than endurance sports or cardiovascular activities. That's the strain score is explicitly designed as a function of the cardiovascular stress placed on the body. The muscular skeletal stress from weightlifting and things like that is also very important, obviously, but that's just not something we're capturing with just heart rate data. And so strain will, will be lower. I think there's still some utility for strain in weightlifting activities. Some days, like if you do the same types of activities in the weightlifting sets or things like that, and you notice strain is way higher or way lower, that that's, why is that happening? So the absolute number is probably lower than the others, but you can still learn stuff from the relative numbers in between it, between sets or between different people. The second point and how whoop is really useful in the weightlifting and powerlifting world is even though your strain is low, because we're measuring true physiological metrics, your heart rate variability is going to be dramatically affected. If you, you know, one rep max or something like that on an activity, your nervous system slams from trying to do that effort. Your body is like you said, you can't walk and things like that. And that will come up in both how the quality of your sleep is and also your heart rate variability the next day, or even perhaps like two or three days afterwards. And so people will use heart rate variability and the recovery to plan their lifting sessions when they go heavy, when they should take an off day. And they can use the strain as a relative gauge. It will be lower. Uh, and sometimes that's psychologically disappointing, uh, but it will be yeah, lower yeah. than any day. Uh, <laughs> but you can still get utility from the system. And it is something, you know, we're constantly thinking and researching how can we create kind of a muscular skeletal type strain uh, with the, the system that we have in place. But that's, that's kind of the, the insight of of that part of the system yeah it's funny you say that i had to laugh because there are times like i finished you know a set or finished a session or whatever and i look at my phone i'm like damn i yeah. got it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and then uh you know i'll go for a you know a, a bike ride or something like that that, that uh feels relatively normal and then i you know i have a strain of like you know 12 or something like that yeah. you know uh and uh, it's my understanding, too, that your recovery will impact your strain, too, right? So if like, I've had times where I've gotten like a really crappy night's sleep and then gone for like a really long mountain bike ride and my strain is through the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just it's, it's been interesting to see the interaction between those variables. Definitely. I think the really cool part is that there is no like we didn't code an explicit interaction between recovery and strain. It's literally because when your recovery is low, your body has to work harder 
per unit output or whatever, mm -hmm. what you were achieving. And so that's really cool that you bring that up is that there is no, those algorithms don't talk to each other on our system. It's literally your body was working harder when you did that activity on a low recovery than on a high recovery. And that's exactly, you know, the point where we're trying to educate the people is that there's better days to do stuff and worse days to do other things. And uh, it may help you train better or prevent injury. And there's actually quite a bit of physiological literature, uh, physiology literature, supporting this idea of optimal training by listening to your body. And I think it's interesting in 2020, almost 2021, uh, that we have so much big data about literally everything from our AWS server cluster to predicting the weather, but we have like one data point a year if you don't have a whoop or something like that when you go get your physical about your body. And it's just like, yeah, maybe maybe we could learn a lot more and optimize a lot more about the most important things we have of our health uh, if we're able to monitor and understand that data. Totally. All right, I want to transition and talk about some of the work that you guys are doing in terms of identifying early stages of COVID-19. You've got a couple of blog posts about this, and I want to give you an opportunity to dive into this in a little bit more detail. So I suppose if you could start with kind of like the, the big picture point of view and maybe talk about some of the specific uh, research endeavors that you're involved in. Yeah, for sure. So this is a really exciting topic for Whoop to be able to show the power of wearables and specifically the Whoop system and the ability to help in, in general public health. Uh, so we started our research efforts around March, right when the pandemic was starting. And it actually happened because one, we were, we were interested in it. We're doing some research just on the data we've collected. But a Whoop user, unfortunately, contracted COVID-19 and wrote in and said, hey, I have COVID, you, can you look at my data? And we're like, oh, this is kind of fascinating. And what we found was we had this metric called respiratory rate, um, which is the amount of times you're breathing. And for us at Whoop, we measure it while, while, uh, during sleep. And what we, we hadn't released it to the public yet. It had actually been running in the background for about two years. Uh, because at Whoop, we have a very strong stance that we don't want to just throw numbers out there. They have to make sense in the system because people two two weeks of seeing a cool number is cool, but then why, why are you going to continue to look at it? So we didn't really know what to do with respiratory rate. Uh, COVID comes along. This guy's data was fascinating. About two days before he officially got uh, tested uh, and I th before he had symptoms was his respiratory rate spiked like crazy. And we started looking around at respiratory rate and all of our data. So heart rate and heart rate variability, as, as you know, can be quite variable night overnight. The interesting thing is respiratory rate was remarkably stable and consistent within the same person night overnight. So we're talking like may a person's average is 15. The standard deviation over a 90 day period was like 0.5. Wow. Except for when you had COVID-19, lower respiratory tract infection, you have to breathe harder to get the same amount of oxygen. Uh, spiked like four, three to five points actually uh, during, during the illness. And that was just such a remarkable statistic that we started like, hey, may, you know, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it's not. And so we started this whole research effort where I used the Whoop journal, the thing that you can track your behaviors in at Whoop, asked people to, to share their data if they're willing to in this research project of, hey, do you have COVID? Do you have, well, do you have symptoms? Yes or no. So we'd get the symptom start date. And then when did you get tested and was it positive or negative? And we built up this uh, database of people and we had their continuous physiological data. And so we were able to develop a machine learning algorithm, which actually to be hundred percent honest, uh, like the machine, like the early data we looked at, it was so exciting because you didn't need fancy algorithms. It's like, oh wow, there's clearly a pattern going on here. Like when your respiratory rate spikes like that, literally nothing else caused that drinking, anything like that. It was literally a thing we'd never seen before in people whose metrics were completely stable. And so we built this algorithm uh, and published it and actually it just got accepted and published online in a peer reviewed journal plus one. Uh, so you can go read the paper and see the data there, but in it, we were able to detect 20% of COVID positive cases uh, two days before symptom onset, and then up to 80% of cases up to three days after symptom onset, just by looking at the respiratory rate. Uh, and another novel finding actually, which hadn't been reported in the literature. And once again, this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, just how primitive our understanding of our bodies are, is the fact that respiratory, nightly respiratory rate is a remarkably stable metric. So that paper had two, two novel findings in it. Cool. I'll uh, 
make sure that the reference to that article goes into the show notes for today's episode. Uh, what uh, can you talk a little bit about the perhaps uh, you know for those who might be concerned that okay you're, when you we say we're collecting data we're collecting data mm-hmm. on users and things like that there's probably some folks in the audience who may be concerned about privacy uh-huh. etc. Uh, so w- w- what what can you say about that? How do you guys store and manage data? Yep, et cetera, et cetera. It's a great question and a great point. And I think everyone, especially with health data or physiological data, has very good reason to be concerned about it. And so we at Whoop are wanted to be extremely transparent and honest with our users and in a way that was privacy centric. So we created a whole privacy center. People can go read a plain text version of our privacy policy and I'll see the full privacy policy. But our, our overarching philosophy is pretty simple. Whoop charges a monthly subscription. So you are not, the customer is not the product. Uh, We don't have to monetize your data, unlike maybe free services like Facebook or things like that, where they have to make revenue, so they're monetizing your data. We do not monetize the data at all. And we have very strict privacy controls and rules within Whoop that, uh, for example, this was an opt-in survey for the COVID-19 thing. And then you have to opt in and give us consent to to analyze that data. And then we do so in an aggregated and de-identified way when we do our data science. But aside from that, no other third party that wasn't affiliated with the, we worked with a research university, of course, to to do this, and they entered in an agreement with Whoop, but no other commercial third party entity has any access to the data, de-identified or not. Uh, It's just, you know, within Whoop to make our product better and to serve better insights to our end user. And when we even do that within Whoop, it's always in a de-identified and aggregated way. So there's, uh, we take great strides to make sure the privacy of our users are protected. Uh, and that's something that we think is a first class feature of Whoop is our privacy of our users' data. Got it, got it. Uh, kind of getting back to a similar theme of the, the work that your guys are doing in COVID-19, are there other novel applications of the Whoop system aside from some of the fitness stuff that we've talked about and aside from the COVID-19 Mm-hmm. Uh, work yeah, that you've definitely. done. Definitely. So I think, you know, the, the first thing I, I, I do have to mention is that Whoop is not a medical product. So we don't make any of these claims within the product itself. We're just a general wellness device, but we're uh, advancing human knowledge forward in these medical fields and learning how maybe one day we could play it in this arena. But right now the product doesn't make any of these claims. Uh, but I think an exciting part, my research background, and actually a large part of the team's research background, we're really excited to give back to science and continue advancing our efforts there. And so another kind of study we did was with uh, Cornell in a study looking at Alzheimer's disease and uh, people that were predisposed to Alzheimer's disease. And you know there is a link between Alzheimer's and sleep architecture particularly. And it showed that Whoop was able to pick up on things that actually blood tests weren't able to pick up on because of the change in the architecture of their sleep uh, compared to a normal control. And when you pair it up with the genetics and everything like that, it's actually a person that was predisposed, uh, um, higher likelihood of getting Alzheimer's later on in life. So that was a fascinating study that was published. And we're actually involved in, I think, over 20 different studies with various researchers across the country in in different kinds of health applications, whether it's a physical uh, illness, a mental disease, chronic disease, uh, or can you pre-screen people? And the power of all these studies and what people get so excited about and what Woo gets so excited about is this idea that, you know, when you go to the doctor, the limits that they're looking at, they don't know your baseline. That's the big difference. And Whoop knows your baseline. And if you can collect the baseline data, then changes in that may not be like clinically significantly high. So, oh, that's sorry. Actually, that's a very important point on the COVID side is the paper showed that these people's spikes in respiratory rate were still below what a clinical definition of high respiratory, elevated respiratory rate was. So if this person showed up with a 16 or 17 breaths per minute nightly respiratory rate, that actually wouldn't trigger any clinical alarms. Typically it has to be over 20 or something like that. But because this person's average was like 13, it was super significant for him. And that's really the power in understanding your baseline. And so all these other researches are doing is like, hey, maybe there's things we can screen for ahead of time by looking at how significant a deviation is for an individual person, not just in a population level, to perhaps prevent uh, disease. That's a really great point. And I know that's a point that's going to resonate with this audience because in the world of behavior analysis, 
virtually all of our research is done in a, you know, what we call a single subject or within subjects design where the individual is their own baseline, their own control group, if you will, uh, perhaps to put it in different languages and you're comparing the kind of pre and post and there's other things you can do to demonstrate experimental control and in, in your research endeavor. So uh, that is definitely something that it's a concept that's near and dear to our heart here in, in behavior analysis. And I'm glad you're bringing that perspective outside of it because it's something that's not really well known or understood i think in different scientific circles so uh that's good to hear so um uh john just have a couple more questions for you here uh what um so again getting back to the kind of the average joe Uh i guess avatar or concept or what have you uh you know as we're kind of uh wrapping up here what are some thoughts you might have in terms of, let's say someone just gets their whoop strap, they order it up, uh, they get it all charged up, they put it on, uh, and they, they're getting it going. Uh, what, are, what are some ways in which, what are some best practices, I suppose, that you could recommend for people who are getting started with this product? Definitely, yeah. So I think there's a, a few things. One is to stick with it uh, for, for the first few days. It does because of our system and we don't want to give you, you know, BS metrics and stuff like that. It re- we really do have to build a baseline. And so we try our best in the first few days based on your demographic data and stuff like that. But it takes, you know, four, seven, 28 days or kind of break points in our algorithms where we're able to really understand your physiological baselines. And so it will take us a little bit of time and we're working on a better experience to guide people kind of through that. Uh, but right now, stick with it uh, and you'll get all these insights. The other thing is pay a lot of attention, I think, personally, to sleep. Uh, That's one of the biggest areas I've seen for improvement and not just, uh, you know, the quality of sleep, but a metric that I've really honed in on. And it is a unique metric we show on Whoop is something called sleep consistency. So the consistency in the time in which you go to bed and wake up has actually been shown in the literature to be just as important, maybe a little bit more important, depending on uh, a bunch of variables, but then the length of time that you were sleeping. And so for me, I, I'm a bit of a gamer. Uh, I like to stay up late uh, and I have a very inconsistent bedtime. And I notice that just throws off my recovery and how I'm feeling the next day more so like I'll still get eight hours of sleep. But because I'm throwing off my circadian rhythm night after night, my body doesn't know what's going on, releasing hormones kind of at the wrong time and things like that. And so really honing in on that metric has really profoundly changed how I feel, which I think is a really important reason to be wearing whoop, you're you're changing behavior to to feel better. Uh, And I I found it as something that's very simple to action. Uh, You know, how do I increase REM sleep? Well, that's going to be harder. You're going to have to track your behavior, see what's correlating, change things about your bedroom environment, stuff like that. This is literally like just prioritize sleep and make sure you're trying to sleep within the same windows every night. It's a very easy action to take, but I think can have a profound effect and will show you the power of the loop system. Just something as simple sounding as that can really change the physiological metrics you're tracking. Awesome. Uh, you know, I, I always hate when people ask me the question, like, you know, where do you see yourself in five years or, you know, that for some reason, you know, that, 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 that question's always irked me, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, tr- I guess, ask where, where is whoop going? I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll vary it slightly and not pin you down to any, any time period or anything like that, mm-hmm. but where, where would you like to see whoop go, uh, uh, it, you know, moving forward? So if we were to kind of, you know, jump in the time machine a couple of years from now, what, 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 what would you see whoop adding uh, or delivering that it's not delivering right now. Yeah. So we have a lot of exciting things in plan for 2021, especially and 2022 that I I can't share right now, but keep our, keep your eyes open. But I think as a, as a general principle, we're now getting to the point where we have so much data, we're able to surface really interesting insights. It's really only like the last year or two that we've been able to do it with the data sets we have. And so I think, giving people a better understanding of how all these different behaviors and external data sets paired into whoop uh, to give you very specific, like hyper-personalized recommendations to accomplish the goals you have is where Whoop wants to go. And, and the way I think, you know, 
we think about it at Whoop is we want to become a ubiquitous like household name, just like kind of like Fitbit is with wearable or Airbnb is with renting uh, renting homes out. Uh, we want to be recovery, strain, and sleep is the way that you should think physiologically about your body day after day. And if that happens, uh, I think that's really really the milestone we have for ourselves. Very good. Well, uh, what a teaser to, 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 to leave us with. So I look forward to seeing how you guys uh, implement that moving forward. Uh, all right. So uh, I will post in the show notes. I uh, I can't remember if it's, is it whoop.com where people can learn more? Correct. Yeah. Whoop.com uh, has all of our information. We have a blog actually there called The Locker, uh, where we post not only um, – various things about the company and the product, but also our validation work uh, we, we published there and also profiles of various people, whether athletes or cognitive performers or like even uh, just various different types of industry work. Uh, you can see how people use Whoop in their lives on, on that. Very good. Uh, John, thanks for joining me today. This has been fascinating and I wish you guys uh, all the best in terms of moving this product forward because I know I've certainly enjoyed it and benefited from it. Thanks, Matt. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>